Hello, everybody, and welcome to In Conversation. Uh, today, it's my great pleasure to be joined by Dr. Linda Essig, Provost and Vice, Senior Vice President of Academic Affairs at Baruch College in New York. Linda, hello and welcome to the show. It's great to have you on. Thank you for joining us here today. Hi, James. Thank you. It's good to see you. So, Linda, you've worked with Intellect and, you know, most recently you, with, in regard to that, you've been the author of Creative Infrastructures, Artists, Money and Entrepreneurial Action, a book which we published back in February of 22. Um, we're going to definitely talk about that today. But before we get on to that book, I'd like to focus a little bit on your career, um, yeah. on academia and on entrepreneurship. Yeah, thanks. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm a, a provost at Baruch College and, and you wouldn't think that somebody coming out of the arts would have that kind of a position, but I actually started my career as a lighting designer. Um, I have an MFA in uh, design for stage and screen from NYU. And I was a freelance lighting designer in New York City for several years before I uh, decided I, I wanted to have a different kind of impact um, and share my lighting expertise with others. And I took a teaching job at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I was there for, for quite some time, long enough to eventually be the department chair. And that kind of whetted my appetite for academic administration. Um, and while I was uh, teaching lighting design and uh, head of the design program at University of Wisconsin-Madison, I was also designing lighting or, or at theaters all, all over the United States. Um, so I had this active kind of freelance career alongside my um, my teaching career, and uh, somewhere in there, maybe towards towards the end of my time at Wisconsin, um, or after I'd gotten tenure there at least, I, I published a book um, called Lighting and the Design Idea. It was like a textbook on lighting design, um, and uh, that got me interested in doing more writing. It was pretty pretty successful as a textbook, and I I ended up kind of shifting my focus away from lighting design practice um, about 14, 15 years ago and, and towards research and writing. But my discipline also shifted focus during that time. So I, I um, became a department chair and then was recruited by Arizona State University um, to, uh, to lead their, um, what was then a, a department of theater and it became School of Theater and Film, and, and it's gone through some other iterations um, since I left there, but uh, I was a, a director of a, a pretty large school that, that tripled in size um, while I was there. And again, I thought, wow, this is really exciting. And I got, got interested in organizational behavior while I was there um, and also in entrepreneurship. So while I was uh, the director of the School of Theater and Film at ASU, ASU launched a, a program called um, I think it was called Entrepreneurship at ASU at the time, and it was funded through the Kauffman Foundation. And um, I uh, hesitate to say this publicly, but many years have passed, so it's probably okay. I accidentally, on purpose, ran into President Michael Crow in the hallway. I said, we have some entrepreneurial ideas here in the School of Theater and Film. How could we get in on this project? And he said, "You know, go talk to this person. Um, that person was, uh, at the time, Kimberly Louie. And, um, what became the PAVE program in arts entrepreneurship grew out of that conversation I had with, with Kimberly Louie. So we uh, were able to launch an arts entrepreneurship program. And the timing of this is important because it was around 2005, 2006. So it was before the Great Recession. And at that time, there were very few programs in arts entrepreneurship. Um, there was very little, at least public recognition in arts schools, both performing arts and visual arts schools, that um, training, teaching uh, emerging artists about the business of their practice was important. It wasn't just wasn't a thing at the time. Um, now, once 2008 and the Great Recession hit, then it was like, wow, how are we gonna teach these artists to make make a living too? But at that time, it was, it was pretty unique. And we launched a series of curricular and co-curricular programming um, at the time. And uh, on the personal side, I, I was interested in entrepreneurship and administration and organizational behavior. So I started taking some classes in our college of, in, in I'm not sure what the school is called now, but the public administration uh, its way into the current book, into creative infrastructures. But also during that time, I launched my blog, Creative Infrastructure, singular. Should have, should have made it plural at the time, but it's too late now. Um, uh, and, and started just doing more informal writing um, and working out some ideas about uh, 
the infrastructure for the arts at the individual level, at the organizational level, and at the system level. Um, and some, a lot of those ideas eventually over time made their way into the book. Um, I think I addressed the timeline uh, that you asked no, about. Awesome. Uh, oh, well, no, not quite. So uh, so <laughs> forgot a couple of steps in there. Um, so uh, in 2018, I, um, I left ASU to become Dean of the College of Arts and Letters at California State University in Los Angeles. Um, and it was there that uh, the, the book uh, was more than a twinkle in my eye. It was about a third finished at the time I made the move. And I thought, oh, how am I going to finish this? And then a year and a half later, the pandemic hit. And I, uh, I don't think the pandemic had too many silver linings. And there was a lot of loss um, due to the pandemic. But somehow, I found the time to write a lot more um, and, and was able to uh, complete creative infrastructures. Um, a full draft um, kind of fall of 2021 and then, um, I'm sorry, fall of 2020, fall of 2020. So I did a lot of writing over that summer of 2020. And then um, in spring of 2021, I was recruited away from Cal State LA to my current position at Baruch College, which is uh, one of our CUNY campuses, City University of New York campuses. Um, and of course, as you know, the book was published um, a few months ago in its final form. So yes, now we're back up to up to the present. Well, I mean, like you say, there's, there's there's not that many silver linings that came out of the pandemic, but I do like to focus on some that that that, that, that did happen. And I think you having the time to write this book definitely, I count them among that, and we're very glad that we were able to publish it. And a fine book it is too. And we will be getting on to discussing that slightly in more detail. But uh, a few things I'd just like to pick out of that. First of all, what yeah. a impressive and varied career within academia, let alone then bringing in actual practice-led lighting design work and 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 your publishing reputation. So lots to talk about there. But just um, I would like to find out a little bit more about your current role at Baruch and what's yeah. going on. But 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 also before we do that, what'd be really interesting to me as well is you know you were at ASU there huge you know huge school campus uni yeah. type vibe sororities sports they're the classic americana university experience yeah. from what i understand and from my experience of visiting the campus as a you know from my pub with my publishing hat on um and then now you're you know one of one of the cuny colleges um and i just as is that quite different from kind of an administrative perspective and from a teaching perspective or 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 is that fairly kind of like easy to kind of slip between those two different style institutions and and of course in terms of phoenix being a really important art city in its own right but then of course now being in new york via california where you have these you know these these great artistic landscapes is there quite a lot is it quite different working you know in arizona versus say new york yeah so I would say the artistic landscape is significantly different, but all four of the institutions I've worked for, University of Wisconsin-Madison, Arizona State University, Cal State LA, and now Baruch College of CUNY have one important uh, thing in common. They're all public universities. Yeah. And uh, to, to, you know, to differing extents, they have an access mission. And Baruch very much has an access mission. Um, and, and really it's about access to excellence. So one of the, paths that I've followed in choosing to go to the different places or they chose me um, has to do with mission and values. And I always, um, I, I, I want to always be at a place where, um, where I can live my values, right? So I, I really believe in the mission of public higher education in providing opportunities for students from any background to have access to really excellent faculty um, to have access to um, experiential learning, whether that's through traditional research or through art practice or through consulting practice. We have a very large business school at Baruch. Um, so, so that experiential learning takes, might take different forms. So there's a through line in, in all of my academic career around, around those kinds of institutions, even though um, you know, the, the weight they might put on teaching or research or access and uh, things might be a little bit different, but um, it's the commitment to public higher education that, that is a through line uh, um, across all of them. Uh, that's, that's really interesting. I didn't actually realize that they were all public institutions. That's, that's interesting to know. Um, 
Ah, and I, I also have read quite a lot when people are referring to you um, and you'll say your position now and, and elsewhere that experiential learning is definitely at the core of what you believe. And what, what do you sort of mean by experiential learning and how, how does that differ from maybe other, other forms that people might be more familiar with? Why is it so important? Yeah, what a great question. So traditional um, university education sort of prior to, I don't know, the 70s or 80s, was about the the sage on stage you know and you'd have a lecture maybe a lecture with a discussion section and you might have two midterms and a final or you might have two papers and a final exam and not all humans whether they're students or not, not all humans can learn that way right that's not necessarily the way all people learn so some people learn more kinesthetically some people um learn by doing so um, you know it's that old. I believe it's a it's a, a Chinese proverb about give a man a fish he'll eat for a day, teach a man to fish he'll eat for a lifetime. Allow the man to or woman, I would say, to catch a fish under the watchful watchful eye of a mentor themselves. You know to go out and cast their line and learn to do that with some support um, is in an, in an even better way, right? So that's how you're teaching you're teaching somebody to fish. Um, by allowing them to fish and giving them feedback on how they do that, just to extend the metaphor a little bit. Um, so you're not lecturing them on how to fish, you're actually providing an experience of fishing and giving them feedback on how they do that, and then they can eat for a lifetime. So, I mean, experiential learning takes lots of forms. I mean, even in a, a more traditional educational setting, you know, you have a science lab, right? That's a form of experiential learning. Um, in the arts, you have studio classes right you don't learn to paint or learn to be a painter by just taking your art history classes and looking at the slides and whatnot you learn to be a painter by painting right so experiential learning is is really important and i think too you learn to be an entrepreneur whether it's an arts entrepreneur or a, a business entrepreneur some other kind of tech entrepreneur small business owner whatever by doing entrepreneurship by going out and putting your work whatever your original um, product is out into the world um, so that it, experiential component is is critical and you know for many years I taught lighting design six well 16 years at at um, University of Wisconsin and you know you you absolutely have to have that laboratory component where a student is you know manipulating the, the light fixtures and focusing the lights pointing them in specific directions and playing around with different colors that technology has changed significantly since the last time I taught lighting, but the basic principle of you have to get there and see what it looks like and manipulate it um, uh, still applies. Well, what, do you do you see any key changes or developments that sort of led to this drive for experiential learning? Do you think it came more from individuals like yourself who are coming from a practice-led background or from entrepreneurship or business, becoming academics across different disciplines, yeah. especially with the arts and humanities, whether it be fine art or fashion design, um, business studies, things of those nature. Do you think it comes from that or do you think it was more of a zeitgeist shift that came from elsewhere? Um, I think it's, I think like most complicate, complex questions, there's more than one response, right? There's, there's multiple <laughs> yeah. facets. So you did have, in the arts especially, and I, I've been in academia long enough to, um, to sort of have seen a change in the arts in academia where you had, and especially I would say the performing arts, I think in the visual arts, you had more of a tradition of artist practitioners in academia. You know, so, but in, in my field in theater, um, until almost the time that I got into it in the late 80s, so, maybe the early 80s, you started seeing more people who are active theater artists, practitioners, going into many, many um, different kinds of academic institutions, not just um, major conservatories like the Yale School of Drama or where I went, the NYU School of the Arts. Um, so I saw that sea change coming in terms of who the faculty, sea change along the way, who the faculty are. But I also think more generally in terms of experiential learning, I think there are two factors um, at play there, and one is this desire to, to provide more access to students from traditionally underrepresented groups who are likely to come from less resourced um, K-12 backgrounds and thus can, will 
potentially have more um, uh, opportunity to learn if they are learning through experience rather than in that stage on stage format, which they might not because of under-resourced community schools might not be able to um, have access to, to, the, to that kind of education. Um, and then the other factor is employment. So employers, and I see this a lot um, with our business programs, right? Employers want to hire students who have had an internship, have had some sort of experience. Um, so they're not just uh, looking at people who have theoretical knowledge of management, but people who have actually managed a project or you know, not just people who have studied marketing theory, but people who have actually done marketing projects, right? And, and it, that are real. So, so there, that's another factor, this employ, the employer, I don't wanna call it pressure, but the employer um, demand for people coming out of higher education who have some actual lived experience. And that's why um, paid internships are so important. So uh, there's a long history of internships and internships in the arts. And you look at the media arts and the film industry, for example, and the un you used to have unpaid internships. Yes. And that creates a tremendous inequity um, because uh, many people, especially students from historically underrepresented groups who might be coming from under-resourced communities, um, can't afford to take an unpaid internship. You know, there's not just the their time, it's their the opportunity cost of that is tremendous. Yes. So having, paid internship opportunities is is something I'm really um, passionate about. Um, I, we had some success when I was at Cal State LA in um, raising some funds to support, you know, paid internships. And it's certainly something that um, that we're working on at Baruch as well. We already have a lot of programming related to internships um, at Baruch. I'd, um, I'd just like to interject there as well and, and say I completely agree with you. Um, it's thing it's so important. Paid internships are so important. and um, uh, especially in the arts and I can speak on that from a publishing yeah. perspective and how important it is for many people to gain experience um, undertaking an internship um, which will then lead to them getting enough experience to then get a job in a highly competitive market of publishing yeah. everyone wants to be in publishing even though it's not the best paid job in the world but but people love it um, I just would like to draw attention to the fact that that's something that we believe in at intellect and uh, not not to just kind of you know highlight that for for you know as we're marketing our own our own our own you know you know um, ethical issues but also just because if people are out there listening to this and they're interested in finding out more about publishing um or want to work in publishing we do offer those on uh, those paid internships yeah. and uh, and i would just just say go and check out the website if anyone's listening and is, is interested in that and at the same same time as well do check out what's going on at baruch and, and, and other colleges where this is yeah. obviously a priority um ethically and practically um, yeah, let me just uh, add for if any Baruch students might be out there, contact the Star Career Center and um, they'll help hook you up with an internship, hopefully paid. Yeah, oh, yeah hopefully paid. I mean, again, it's uh, it's not like everyone can get a, a paid internship, but they're definitely out there. And again, we're, we're again looking to um, help people from under-resourced backgrounds as well. And that's something that's key to us. And again, with some of our journals, you know, we we ensure that they're available globally to less economically developed um, sort of countries or institutions. But again, we kind of then we're forgetting that what about, you know, inner cities, for example, um, in areas like New York, where we may be talking about like the urban environment, the architecture, or say with our Journal of Global Hip Hop Studies, for example, you know, we're talking about art forms that have been created within the city and not just in New York, we talk about Chicago and other places, for example, all across the United States and Europe. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, enable those public libraries um, access to the content for free as well, not just academic sort of libraries where maybe there's still some gatekeeping going on there so you know you can go to a public library and get access to our journal of global hip-hop studies which is a peer-reviewed academic publication but at the same time you know it's uh, it's widely accessible and um you know and, and hopefully people who are involved in the industry or in the create or using hip-hop and other things as a creative outlet will be able to read that you know and develop their own work as a result of it so i think all these things within the arts are vitally important and it's it's you know we're going to we can get into this a bit about you know late capitalism and, and and how the arts fits into that but you know it's up to companies like intellect and for, to institutions like baruch to you know be spearheading um such campaigns and to be providing a space for people to do paid internships and, and other ethical things, you know.
Uh, anyway, just a bit of a bit of a tangent Thank there. You. Thanks. And just in with regard to um, academia generally, before we specific, you know, you've had a career um, and a long and storied one by the sounds of it. So, uh, other than some of the things you already highlighted, are there any other major changes that you've you that, that you perceive? Anything that you know, it's like, wow, that's so different than when I started, or there's greater opportunities here, or right. the arts has been crushed, or you know, it, is there anything you you know that, that sticks out to you as kind of like major changes within the the arts and academia and the arts? Well. Um... I have been in academia now for 34 years, so I've seen a lot of change. So one change is in my original discipline of lighting design, like the technology has changed so much. I could not walk into a classroom now and teach lighting design because the technology is different, fundamentally different, like the light bulbs themselves are different than they were when, when I stopped teaching lighting. So that's, that's one change at the discipline level. Another change in arts and academia is when I started, um, in the early, uh, I'm sorry, in the late 80s, um, artists with MFAs, keep, remember I got my PhD much later, I was much later in life, I, um, artists with MFAs did not necessarily uh, have a road to get tenure at um, US institutions of higher education that I wouldn't say that that time in the late 80s was the leading edge of the change, it was sort of the tail end. So by the time I got there, that was a little more of a norm. But now um, there are lots of threats to tenure and that's coming from, and that's not just the arts. I mean, that's coming from our um, quite divisive political climate and um, a kind of misconception about what academic freedom means um, and, um, and pressure to, uh, to conform to certain ways of thinking and um, academic freedom and tenure protects that Linda, thanks for talking to us a lot there about um, academia and about your academic background. Um, it's great to know what's going on at Baruch and other different places that you've worked. But I would like to just um, now look at maybe your work as a as a lighting designer. Um, oh gosh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm. I mean, I know you said things have changed and you maybe yeah. wouldn't feel so comfortable in the classroom anymore. But I got a few few questions on this. Sure. So I, I know you weren't really a, a lampy. You were much more of an actual lighting designer. So I just wanted to ask you a little bit about how you got into that and yeah. uh, some of your some of your most memorable experiences. Perhaps are there any particular shows or performances you were involved yeah. with, um, or designs that you're involved with that um, that really stand out for you from that 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 past life. Yeah, so that's uh, it's fun to kind of think back to that. I haven't designed lighting since 2008, so that's 14 years ago now since the last time I designed anything. Um, and I got into lighting in high school, um, you know, just like nobody else wanted to do it, so I did it. And then I had one of those internships, um, unpaid at first, uh, at a theater. Um, where I was able to learn a bit more. And then uh, I went to NYU to study lighting design, um, both as an undergraduate and a, and a graduate student. Um, I had a lot of good opportunities when I was in New York, but uh, it's, you know, the commercial theater world is really um, drives New York theater. Mm. And uh, I was working a lot as an assistant designer, which is the road to being a designer. But I, um, you know, a couple of shows you may have heard of, like Driving Miss Daisy, when its yeah. original incarnation. So I was the assistant lighting designer on 22 different productions of that all over the world. Um, kept me kept me busy for a couple of years. But I also uh, was interested in the time at architectural lighting, in architectural lighting, and I, I actually had um, uh, a, a sort of a day job, right? I mean, not sort of a day job, it was a full-time job at um, a lighting consultancy called Domingo Gonzalez Design. And that taught me a lot. I spent about a year with them before I went moved to Madison. Um, and from my Madison um, location, I was able to design a lot for uh, Lord theaters, so nonprofit professional theaters. And I designed for um, Cleveland Playhouse, for uh, Milwaukee Rep, Pioneer Theater, Utah Shakespeare Festival, um, Missouri Rep, a few other places around the country, and just um, really make sure that I had the chops to stay in the classroom too. Like I had to keep a professional 
presence in order to also have any um, you know viability or legitimacy to teach in the classroom. So I think that was really important. I would take my students with me, especially to Utah Shea, because I would always bring a, I designed six seasons there and would have a different student accompany me each time um, so that they could get that experiential learning too. Paid positions, by the way, going back to our earlier conversation. Um, so in terms of memorable projects, I, you know, there's this project I did. I mean, most of my work was out, outside of the university, but sometimes you're able to do more experimentation inside a university because there are less of these commercial pressures or ticket sales pressures. And um, I did a project called uh, The Water Station, it was a Japanese play. It didn't have any words. It was uh, directed by um, the late Philip Cirilli. I don't know if you're familiar with him. No, and, I'm not and uh, what I liked about it was, I, I don't think I, I think I used like one stage light, like all the lighting sources were found yeah. and kind of in the set and each segment of, it was like seven or nine or 10 segments, I don't really remember, was like lit with a single source of light that was like just this really carefully placed mm -hmm. single item. And I just, I really enjoyed having to make those kinds of choices like, I mean, I didn't have to. I made a choice to. Put, I put that parameter around myself, um, in order to experiment with these different light sources, and I really enjoyed doing that. Um, on the other hand, I also enjoyed doing things like, you know, production of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat with 200 yeah. light cues in the first five minutes. Yeah. That was yeah. also fun. So you know, I had a really good relationship with a company that's um, just outside of Madison um, called ETC or Electronic Theater Controls, and they're they're now probably one of the, the largest or one of the largest lighting, um, of theatrical lighting manufacturers in the, in the country, if not the world. When I started it in Wisconsin, they were they were quite small. So I had a very good relationship with them and we were able to like test out equipment and, and things like that. So that was, you know, that made it fun, like that experimentation and, and working with um, somebody who was truly an entrepreneur, Fred Foster, also uh, may he rest in peace. Um, uh, and in fact, when I, when we launched the PAVE program in arts entrepreneurship at ASU, so you know I've, I've relocated, he was the head of ETC. Was one of the first people I invited to give a talk on our on our entrepreneurship speaker series because he was just this quintessential arts entrepreneur. Um, anyway, yeah, that's oh. that's a little bit about the lighting lighting world. I oh, thank you. No, thanks for sharing. Uh, I, well, I actually when I was at university, um, I ended up being a, a lighting engineer and and. Uh, and a lighting designer, lighting tech for a while. So it's always interesting to hear people's oh, experiences. Yeah. Mine was all on musical shows for the most part though. So not not really in, in yeah. dramaturgy and, and, and theater. But um, yeah, so it was quite different. Uh, it was often about speed and, and different, yes. you know, different, but certain people, you know, different lights, different tones, they had very specific requirements, you know, especially as they got more, more famous. Um, so I worked with lots of different performers from all over the world. Yeah. And it was always, a fascinating period in my life and uh, um yeah i don't think i would know my my ear from my elbow when it came right. to hang out, getting around the contemporary lighting um desk and i know that the lights are incredible these days but we we just kind yeah. of had new heads and things um when i was there but yeah it's interesting so well it just brought back a memory my first ever quote unquote design was for um the coasters the crystals and the cleft tones which was like these Duop group kind of resurgence. It would have been 1981, probably 82. Yeah, and just you just yeah, very quickly on your feet, moving stuff around, doing what you need to do to make this concert happen. Yeah. Right. I remember one just to regale you with one of my stories. I uh, I, I did lights for a lot of different bands, and um, once I did them, uh, the lights for the Stiff Little Fingers, which is, uh, you may recall, a kind of a punk band. Um, and they, uh, I must have been like 19 at the time or something and, and pretty green. And I didn't, I, I couldn't change what they wanted on stage at the time. Um, and they, uh, I just remember them calling me out and getting the crowd to boo me. No disrespect to Stiff Little Fingers. It was the most punk thing that had ever happened to me. And I did, <laughs> did, I did get it sorted in the end. And they were really nice to me afterwards. It was kind of part of the show and the, that I think the you know the, the presentation, but um, yeah, that was kind of that was kind of pretty cool and pretty scary. 
but I had I had some other really nice uh, nice experiences too. But um, but yeah, wonderful a wonderful profession. If anyone else is interested in getting in that, then definitely worth um, definitely worth it. But I, um, it leads us on to to books though in general, and um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your books on lighting design and and if you were able to translate any of those experiences because i know experiential learning is definitely important to you yeah. into the books that you wrote and, and, and oh and yeah totally i so lighting and the design idea which is a textbook and it's gone through three editions so 96 was the first edition 2002 and then again in 2012 with the co-author because i wasn't going to rewrite it all myself <laughs> um uh was really based on on my design process. Um, you know, it was based on what I had learned at NYU and then evolved over time designing for um, professional theater companies. And then also, you know, engaging with other lighting designers about their process. But it was that that book is organized along the design process. So it starts with like, unlike other lighting books, it doesn't start with here's electricity and here's lighting equipment. It starts with how do you read a play or how do you engage with the material that you're designing? So that doesn't have to be a play. And then, you know, moves from there on to how do you create your your visual approach and then how do you implement it? So it, it kind of followed the design process very much and, and was very integrated in, into, that, um, into that book. Um, and then another book, so that had three editions, and then another book was uh, called The Speed of Light and um, Speed of Light Dialogues on Lighting Techno lighting Something and Technological Change, something like that. It's a while ago. Um, that came out in 2000, and that's an oral history. So I interviewed, and in some ways it, it was uh, methodologically, it was kind of a step towards creative infrastructures too, because I interviewed about 20 people, and then I cut and cut and pasted the interviews together to create the story of um, several key lighting technolo technological developments, um, computer lighting control, um, moving lights, um, just to get really wonky, uh, the control signal that goes between con consoles and lights, but it's really important and yeah. sort of t hopefully tell the story in an engaging way in the book. Um, so uh, that was fun and and got me talking to a lot of people like both designers and industry people and inventors um you know people who are truly innovators whose whose work has had impact so um hadn't made that through line connection between that book and the new one until now so thank you for that opportunity and then i wrote i wrote another book that uh later that's not lighting related um uh that's a handbook for artists entre arts entrepreneurs um mm -hmm. And that was uh, kind of a handbook funded through the Arizona State Arts Commission, um, uh, kind of a guidebook for artists in Arizona. Um, I think that's it for books. Yeah. I know. Well, thank. Well, thanks for for setting the scene. Yeah. I mean, and it's really interesting to always hear where, you know, how how authors and you know landed on the book that they have worked yeah. on with us, for example. Um, and to talk about the book that you have published with Intellect. Um, let's get into creative infrastructures, artists, money, and entrepreneurial action. Um, first, though, congratulations! Um, Thank you. Thank truly you. fantastic book, and 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 not, you don't just have to take my word for that because we've had some exceptional reviews coming in, and we've got oh, some thanks. wonderful pull pull quotes that people can read um, on our website. And I would just advise people after listening to this to go to www.intellectbooks.com. Um, and um, take a look at creative infrastructures on there. Lots of information and content that you can check it out. But Linda, tell us about the book. W what's it all about in a nutshell? And, and why, is it, why is it so important? And and why did you why did you write it at this time in your career? So three. Yeah, sort great. Of Thank you. So um, it, creative infrastructures is a book of essays. So it's it's in some ways it's about one thing, but it's about ten different things because there are ten different essays, and we can talk about why I approach it that way a little later, but it's really about um, how artists make a living and a life in the economy. And uh, I talk a lot, you mentioned, you used the phrase late capitalist uh, economy earlier, and I, I talk a lot about that, about mm -hmm. the fact that we're at this kind of bubble point. And um, I did start the book before the pandemic, um, where it really felt even more than now, it really felt like capital 
is just growing and growing and growing, but is held by fewer and fewer and fewer people. And so many more people are down here that inequity, I mean, if, if you're familiar with Thomas Piketty's work um, at all, uh, Capital for the 21st Century and everything that's come after that, this notion of the concentration of capital. And, you know, artists are really left behind in that. No, you know, there are artists who are up here in the in the, the big balloon of capital, but not that many. And and we all know artists, like we, maybe we are artists, right? Um, people who have professional practice as artists who maybe they're teaching art, they're doing their art on when they can outside of other jobs, or they're, they go to their studio every day, but they're not, you know, they're not making big balloon capital at it. They're just making enough to sustain themselves. And it really started to feel like there's there's got to be a different way of thinking about what artists create and and what what their human capital is, their intellectual capital, their creative capital, um, and how they can uh, capitalize on it, how they can use their creative capital to make a living and a life, to connect their work directly with their audience. And that's the essence of arts entrepreneurship. And that's what the book is about. Right. And, and I use, you know, in some cases, formal case studies, and in other cases, just um, uh, weaving together different observations that I've made over the years to, to explain the different ways that artists uh, make a living in life um, by connecting their work with audiences. Well, I was actually—I was going to ask you and uh, to quote you as well here. Uh, the book endeavors to untie the complex relationships between artists and entrepreneurship in order to yeah. answer the question: How can artists make work and thrive in this late capitalist society? Um, would you unpick that a little bit more for us? Yeah. So, as I was talking about earlier, we launched um, the Pave Program in Arts Entrepreneurship around two thousand five, two thousand six, and I spent, you know, a, a at least 12 years after that and three years after that with this book, um, you know, really devoting time and thought to what is, what is arts entrepreneurship? And entrepreneurship traditionally is something that happens in business when it's, when it's addressed at the level of a university, it's usually done in a business school. It is uh, thought of, by many as the foundation of capitalism. And remember capitalism has all the capital up here and the artists aren't part of that. So a lot of artists have a really hard time thinking about themselves as entrepreneurs. Yeah. But artists make original work that through some exchange goes out into the world and they get remuneration of some kind for that, we hope. Um, and that's entrepreneurship, right? They're, they're, they have a unique product and they've built a structure um, or a part of a structure that uh, is, is designed to get that work out to somebody who's going to, to, to provide something in exchange for that work. And that something might not be money. It could be time, it could be other work, it could be, you know, the- Absent the in the case what, of Van Gogh, I suppose. <laughs> pardon me? I said absent in the case of Van Gogh, I suppose. Yes, well, and I use him as a counterexample, right? He is not an artist entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. He's not. He's he's making all that work. He didn't reap much benefit from it in his lifetime. But the book is really addressed to what I call the quotidian artist, like the people who are making work, you know, the sort of everyday people, everyday artists who make work and they make good work and they get it out in the world. And, and how do they connect with their audience, right? Um, and they may or may not see themselves as entrepreneurs, but every individual artist who sells a painting is a sole proprietor business. I mean, they, they are, like legally they are, right? In tax code, they are, they are a business. And we don't need to think of ourselves, artists don't need to think of themselves as businesses, but they do need to pay some attention to their business practice. And I don't wanna, I don't want the listeners to think that this is a book about how to do your business as an artist, because it's not. They'll be disappointed <laughs> if they think that that's what it is. It's more about how do we situate artists in the economy in a way that is good for the artists and good for the culture. 
Um, and that's think, really what the book's about too. I think that's a beautiful nutshell there at the end. That's a real a great soundbite that that really does kind of capture and encapsulate the book, I think, and why and why it's so important. So I think you've hit hit the nail on the head there. Um, but yeah, it's not a how do I get rich uh, quick uh, book for for artist practitioners. But it, it really, I really like that idea of um, how you situate artists within the economy. That's very really important, I think. You've alluded there as well to the audience, and obviously yeah. artists part audience. But who who did you really write the book for? Who's the audience? Who's this aimed at? You yeah, know? thanks. So I think it's for arts audiences and for artists, and also for. Um, uh, people in academia who need um, a text that they can use with student artists. So it's, it's really for those three groups. So I like to say artists, people want to be artists and people who care about artists um, would be the, would be those, those three groups of people, but it's not an, it's, it's um, not uh, written like I would write a policy analysis paper, you know, mm -hmm. sort of slightly perhaps drier, um, uh, analytical piece it's it is written for a lay audience a lot of it's based on material that i had um collected over years on the creative infrastructure blog but then expanded and cleaned up and, and whatnot um so i think it's it's really for uh any anybody who touches the arts uh could be interested in this book um which is a lot of people you know, yeah. what, what, what's what's interesting when you talk to um, the general public and you're trying to get support for, say, public funding for the arts, you know, and you just ask a room full of people, how many of you or have uh, have taken piano lessons or have children who have taken piano lessons? Or how many of you have had an art class or have a child who has an art class? And like by the end of asking two or three of those questions, every single person in the room has raised their hands because everybody engages with the arts in some way. But this book is focused on the professional art. It's not it's not for the professional artists, but it's about professional artists, people who spend their days making art. I wanted to ask you a little bit of, about your process and yeah. about the style of writing as well, because it's tell us a bit about how you kind of wrote these 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 essays. Um, and and you've you've also mentioned a few of the blog and a few other things. So yeah. what was the foundation? What was the research and and and, and how, did you publish peer-reviewed papers or did you go to conferences? Where did this kind of come from? And, yeah. and tell us about the kind of method you employed in the, in the writing style. So I have, um, I've written a lot of peer-reviewed papers and this book is not any of those. Um, I've also written white papers that are commissioned um, uh, by either uh, an agency or a foundation. Um, it's a little closer to that. In other words, not necessarily for another scholar to read, but more more for a practitioner. Um, but it it uh, it is separate essays. And to explain why I did that, it's very it was a very practical decision to loop back to your first question, which is you know what does it mean to be a provost, right? It, <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a big job. So I um, I knew that I might be. Um, making some kind of a, a professional transition, and then I wouldn't be able to write something that went beginning to end. And so by writing, by conceiving of the book as individual essays, I knew that I could stop and start if needed. So that was a very practical reason for writing in the essay format, I'm not gonna lie. Um, you already published it, so no harm now in telling you the truth. Um, Hey, as long as it turns up on our desks on the right day, we are happy, you know. Yes, it's and it was, you know, it was a little late, but, uh, you know, <laughs> pandemic. And I, because I did have that transition, um, it actually got delayed a year. But uh, uh, I also wanted to build on ideas that were on my blog. So I launched that blog on New Year's Eve of 2010, which was right as I was transitioning away from being the director of the School of Theater and Film and into a, a different role as director of entrepreneurship programs um, for uh, the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts, which is the Art and Design College of, of ASU. So I was really focusing at that time on arts entrepreneurship and, and thinking through some ideas. So I really wanted to develop um, some of those ideas that were seated there into the book. And I think that the primary um, impetus was a talk I gave, I wanna say it was in 2014, might've been 2012. At, at, I was invited back to the University of Wisconsin-Madison to their business school 
to give a, a talk, um, a keynote at a conference that was about arts and business. And it was for that conference that I developed this metaphor of the Ouroboros or Ouroboros, um, the serpent eating its tail. And that idea of art, innovation, entrepreneurship, and money feeding back into the art really stuck with me. And, and it's from there that I developed that combined with the ideas in the blog that I developed each of the essays. So, so that metaphor became the outline for the book. It's like, okay, I know I want separate essays. I'm going to think about art first. I'm going to think about innovation. I'm going to think about entrepreneurship. I'm going to think about money and write some essays that kind of follow along that. I'm going to hold up the book so you can see what I mean by an Ouroboros, kind of that circular serpent eating its tail image. Um, so, so that was a real, um, what's the word? It's kind of lit the flame for the book, was that, that talk that I gave, uh, maybe it's 2014, I guess, um, where I first really pushed out this metaphor. Oh, well, thanks for bringing that up. That was actually one of my questions. I oh. think it's uh, it's, really, uh, it's really interesting. I'm glad you unpacked it. And I, I would also just like to shout out our design team because I, and of course yourself for your, you know, for the idea, but I think it looks fantastic, the cover, and works really well in collaborating, collaboration with that metaphor there. Um, and people can go, again, back to www.interlapbooks.com and have a real good look at the cover um, and also have a good read of some excellent reviews. But while I've only got you here for a little bit longer, I have a couple other questions. Yeah. And um, you've already kind of you've already kind of unpacked a couple of trade secrets as well um, with regard to why you, you, you your style of writing was more kind of in, a, in an essay form. And I think that's great. And and I'd like you to build on that, actually, yeah. with this next question here, where I would just would you have any advice and guidance um, for people who are, you know, artist writers or who are writing perhaps their first book? Um, I think that's a that was a great, a great suggestion. You know, you be practical yeah. if, you, if you're going to be between positions. Yeah. Or different roles all the time and you're under in a high pressure environment write the thing as essays so you can dip yeah. in and dip out and you know create a compendium almost so i want to backtrack a little bit and also answer the question at the same time which is the other reason i wrote in the essay form was because i wanted to write for a broader audience right so the number one piece of advice i have for upcoming writers but also for entrepreneurs of any kind including arts entrepreneurs is be mindful of who your audience is right so an ar artist, what I, one of the things I'm fond of saying back when I was teaching arts entrepreneurship is, you know, artists make work. Artists who are entrepreneurs make work for other people. You know, they, they're not just artists. They're also people who get the work out. So always be mindful of who that audience is. And that's true for writers as well. So, um, uh, you know, are you writing for an academic audience for a journal that has certain editorial expectations? If so, get to know that journal. You know what? How are those? You know how are those articles um, organized? What are the research methods that are prevalent in that journal? I I submitted a, an article to a journal. I, I don't remember what the journal was. I had never written in it before, but I had cited a couple of things from it. And the letter I got back was from. Are you? Do you know this journal at all? Like, what were you thinking? You know, so that's another thing is be prepared for for the uh, the rejections because the rejections will come. So you'll get rejections, you'll get revised and resubmits, and that's all part of the process. So if you get something that's outright rejected, why was it rejected? You know, is it because the research methods are not rigorous enough? Is it because the writing style is inappropriate? You know, what's what's the problem, right? And usually, um, you know, an editor will give you the reader's reports; they're anonymized. You know, for a, a journal article. Um, Talk to the editors, you know, um, find out what they're looking for um, in terms of the writing style um, with a journal article. Um, and, you know, a, 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 academic journal article is one thing. A book is a different animal, um, as, as you all know, James. You know, and, you, and I know you publish both journals and books. So a book is, long, that was the other reason I wrote, you know, in the format I did is I, I wanted a longer form, right, than you could have. Um, even though they're all separate essays, they do interlink with one another. There are artists who show up, you know, in the essays uh, throughout the book. So, you know, in writing a book, um, 
you want to you really want to know your audience and here's why here's the dirty little secret for those of you who are not the publisher sitting sitting across from me in my zoom room um, is the publisher wants to make sure there's an audience it's expensive to publish a book it's expensive to market a book and they want to make sure that there's going to be an audience for this book so do your research on who your audience is and what other books are addressed to that audience right so um, that's also really important um, and it doesn't really speak to the writing style, but it does speak to the way the proposal is written. So um, yes. make sure that then your writing style is a match for that audience. Um, so there's, there's, uh, you know, you want to pick up a book and have it be, as a reader, you know, and have it be over your head or, you know, under your head. I don't know what that would be speaking down to you and so my condescending. So you want to be able to match your your writing style um, with that. Um, and then the last thing, going back to practicality, is find the time to don't find the time to write. Make the time to write. So you know, I in the uh, prologue, I thank my. I was I wrote a lot of this book while I was serving as a dean, and um, probably two thirds of it at least. And and I thank my assistant. I said, finally, I want to. Uh, uh, where does it say this? Special thanks go to my assistant. Flora Saavedra Hernandez, who helped me to carve a few hours a week, most weeks, out of an otherwise packed calendar. You have to make the time to write. And for those of you who are academics, uh, it's probably part of your job, so you are well within your rights to say, hey, every Thursday morning, that's the time I used, Thursday mornings, I'm gonna work on this project, or all day Friday, I'm gonna work on this project. And it's not the time to do your laundry, it's not the time to pick up your kids from soccer. It, you have to have the writing time and have the discipline to do that. Um, sometimes I, I, people are surprised to learn that I wrote um, The Speed of Light. Well, I wrote, I wrote The Speed of Light on uh, maternity leave. And, you know, that's just, I had the concentrated time to do it. Um, and uh, my, my child at that time was an infant. And if there were two, I probably couldn't have done it. Um, actually, I had a two year old at the time, too. But anyway, I digress. But you know the infant is in the car seat, in the in the bouncy seat, and I can do some writing while that's happening. But I wasn't going to meetings and and going to classes and stuff. So that was that was helpful. Not every parent can do that. I have to say, I had I was very fortunate with children who slept. So they, um, anyway, I got on a bit of a digression there. But the the moral is you have to you have to make sure that you sequester the time to do the writing and and be disciplined about it. I'm sure you would agree, James. I would 100% agree, not only with that, but with everything you've just said and um, uh, revelatory. And you're, it's, 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 it's like you've attended one of my workshops, and I don't think you have. <laughs> it's these are these are these are the, the main concerns that we have yeah. when we're looking at a book proposal or or when one's submitting to a to a peer reviewed journal publication as well. I mean, there's lots to add, but the you really have hit some of the you know the most important factors there, and I think knowing your audience but also being true to yourself and to the project and that is not mm -hmm. trying to write a proposal pretending that something is a trade book when in fact it's an academic book as an academic publisher we don't we want academic books we don't right. want you to pretend it's harry potter when in fact it's 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 not it's it's a it's a Foucault, you know so it, it's um it's very important that you're just realistic and you're honest yeah. in your praise of the work one, one last one one last sure. piece of advice there is get somebody else to read it before you submit it to your publisher. So I had a couple of colleagues, Adrian Callender at University of Arkansas and Sherry Helwig at University of Toronto, and and uh, I think maybe a couple of other people read whole essays and gave me really good feedback. And um, I know Adrian, uh, you know, actually used one of the essays pre-publication in her class and was able to kind of test out some of the principles. That was essay five, by the way, if any of you are interested, um, you can use it in class. So, uh, I, you know, I'm sort of well aware that some of the essays get a little bit in the weeds of theory or political history. But on the other hand, that gives a faculty member some real fodder for discussion in the classroom and sort of paths to take into um, into some of the original literature that I'm referencing. So um, don't, uh, go, moving back to the moral of the story is have somebody else look at it, um, not just for copy editing, but for real like content, somebody who understands the discipline. Um, I think that's really helpful. And I'm really fortunate to have colleagues who are willing to do that for me. Uh, that is a, a, a great privilege and a benefit of being a little more senior 
um, is that I, I have a little bit of a backstop there. It's uh, it's that's certainly one of the things that we we really try to uh, explain to people when they're in the early processes with a developmental editor. Yeah. That they should also have other people reading it from the discipline, from their school, yeah. who can who can keep things moving and and just a just a fact check and sanity check things. And and you know especially with the with the proposal as well, make sure someone's read the proposal and the yes. stuff it raw and sat on it for a couple of days come back to it and you know be sure there aren't any silly mistakes or or you know the classic that you haven't uh, submitted to another publisher's author question yeah another publisher using the different author questionnaire which is a classic sometimes you'll get people yeah. <laughs> submitting on a you know different company's proposal form to you know so things like that really important to kind of you know expediting your yeah. chance to get and I want to give a shout out to Sharon Loudon, who's another intellect um, author. Um, she has a whole book series on um, the artist as culture producer. And um, and if it weren't for her, I wouldn't be here because, uh, James, I you were not the first publisher I submitted to. I did have a couple of rejections. And then I was talking about the book with Sharon. Sharon's one of the artists that I interview um, in the book and uh, her perspective really profoundly influenced me, especially this notion of, of um, creating community well-being, um, which you'll see peppered in the book. And I, I really owe that to Sharon. But I also owe to Sharon her introduction to uh, to the development editor, to Tim Mitchell. So, um, and her books are uh, really a wonderful resource. I quote liberally from them because they're kind of like primary source material. They are verbatim um, from artists uh, from all over, the, all over the United States. And I think the UK, I'm not sure, I don't recall. Um, but uh, really artists sharing their experience on how they make a living in a life. And so uh, in some ways, my book is a companion to that series. Um, I would also just like to thank Sharon for all of her work on our behalf. She's a wonderful ambassador for intellect and yeah. for arts entrepreneurship. And yeah. she ensures that artists and educators get paid for their time and their yeah. work. She is a force of nature when it comes to traveling the world and representing the yeah. work of other artists as well as her. her her own work um no so she's a peerless campaigner a wonderful scholar and a great artist in her own right if you go again to www.intellectbooks.com you can find sharon loudon's books on there do take a look at them uh, and of course all the wonderful artists because each book contains the work and, and interviews and discussions of 40 working contemporary artists um and there's going to be a broader series you know with books that look at um, aging artists and all kinds of different topics as well so it's yeah, going to be I'm I'm really excited about the one on, on parents and the one on yeah. artists over 50 being both of those things. So that, yeah, very excited it's, about it's that. So relevant, but, but again, people have not necessarily kind of dealt with that yeah. um, in the past. So it's a really wonderful series and I do uh, urge everyone to go and check out Sharon Loudon and um, the artist's culture producer and living a, a, a living and sustaining a creative life. But um, Linda, I know you're gonna have to run in a minute. So I yeah. just want to take this opportunity to, first of all, thank you um, both for, for, for choosing to work with us on this fantastic book. Um, and also just for, for spending some time discussing your life and career and the book itself with me today. I think we could carry this on forever and I'm gonna have you back for sure. Um, you're a wonderful example of an academic leader. Uh, I really appreciate you know your time and the things that you're trying to implement um, and it's a real pleasure to have you on board the intellect team um, again I've got to plug the book and say everyone do go and check out the book um, creative infrastructures there it is go and check it out on our website um, intellectbooks.com or on any other reputable website um, or, or all good booksellers of course as well and go and place your orders in brick and mortar bookstores um we all we all we all rely upon them and we all want them to succeed still as well um yes if, you, yes, if you're in new york go to the strand strand books excellent still, yeah still standing cool. many years later so yeah it's still it's still a wonderful wonderful place where they host great great um interviews with authors and and you know book signings things of that nature too um we're in our last couple of minutes do you is there any final thoughts anything you'd like to say or um over to you Oh, um, well, I just want to thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you today about, uh, I thought we would talk about the book, and we ended up talking about me, which um, I, well, I'm, pretty hum I'm a pretty humble person, so uh, that um, was unexpected, but always uh, interesting to think, and, and thank you for helping me connect an earlier book to this book in terms of its methodology. And uh, so thank you for the opportunity today, but thank you to Intellect for the opportunity to um, find a really uh, broader audience um, for this work and, and 
for this notion of arts entrepreneurship as something that is, uh, it's, not, it's not a bad word, entrepreneurship. It just means you're connecting, connecting with your audience. And I, I think we'll close there, if that's okay with you. Thank you again. Appreciate your time. Thanks.